Can you hear me now? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Amen, amen. Thank you, Monica. I know that probably took a little oomph out of you to do that extra for me, but I appreciate it. I need that. Amen? Amen. amen. That's one of my favorite songs. One of my friends, uh, Mina, in New York, Mina Andrews, she turned me on to that, and I was been singing it ever since. Bobby, can you turn me up a little bit? All right, thank you, thank you. Okay, oh, Lauren is here, how beautiful you look. <laughs> Amen. All right, let's pray. Amen. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we're always mindful of your presence in this place. You're an awesome God. You're a loving God. You're a kind God. You're a faithful God. You are a covenant-keeping God. And most of all, Father God, no, no matter what we go through, no matter what challenges or storms may come our way, we'll keep our eyes focused on you. For you, Father God, have started a work in each and every one of us that you've promised to complete. We stand here boldly declaring, Father, that we are a masterpiece created by you and you alone. So therefore, men will see you through us and will know that the God that we serve, that you're alive, that you're mighty, that you're powerful, and that you're bold. And they will ask us, what manner of God is this that you serve, that he would do all this for you, that he's mindful of you? For even the angels ask, what manner of man that you are always so mindful? So Father, that lets me know that you're always watching over us. You're always protecting us from troubles seen and unseen, and that you provide provided the ultimate sacrifice, your dear son Jesus, to die on the cross so that we might know that all things are possible to those of us that believe, that every mountain will be removed if we speak to it and believe in our heart, never doubting but being fully persuaded that you are God and God alone. We thank you, Father. Holy Spirit, I ask that you rule and reign in this place today. Your presence will hover over us, for we have invited you in, we've wested you in, for Father, you can always be found wherever praises are going up. Your presence will be found. So we expect you here today to glorify you and you alone is all that we will do in our lives, in our speech, and in our belief. In Jesus' mighty name, let God's people say amen and amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Pastor is in New York having a good time. He's been there five days. TJ and I have been on our own, but we've been enjoying ourselves. Amen. Amen. We've been eating out. <laughs> amen. Amen. All right. Let's hold up our Bibles. Let's, well, first of all, he says, let's look at, uh, look at our neighbor and smile. Show your 32s, your 22s, your 12s, your 2s. If you only have one left, uh, use it this morning, and then we'll give you uh, some information on a good dentist after service. Amen. 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 God, we, we, I came here with 32. I will leave with 32. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let's hold up our Bibles. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. I'm a believer and not a doubter. I'm a doer and not just a hearer. I believe this word from Genesis through Revelation. So let God be true and every man, every woman that goes against it is a liar. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Pastor has been talking about born identity. And, uh, well, he's been talking about identity crisis. And I have the Holy Spirit put on my heart simply because I interact with a lot of women mostly. Uh, very few men, but I see it in them as well. But often it's, you can stay in an identity crisis if you don't know who you are in Christ Jesus. If you don't know who God created you to be. And he said that from the foundation of the earth that he created us to be powerful in the earth realm because the power that we show and that we, ex we exhibit to the to the world is the same power that's going to save them that will cause them to rise up and want to know who is this God that you serve? Who is this Jesus? But if we are powerless, then we are not able to complete our assignment in the earth realm. So he's always trying to remind us of who we are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. So there's a, there's a lie that he wants us to believe. And so we, let's go to Acts, the book of Acts. 
and that's in the New Testament. And let's go to chapter 10. When I was a little girl, I grew up in the Catholic Church, and so there's some foundational things that I can't get away from because I was Catholic until I married Terry, and I am 54, so uh, a lot of my life was spent in Catholicism, so there's some things that I don't forget. So I always remember Acts because Acts and Romans, they used to always tell, act Roman, don't act Roman. <laughs> so anyway, so for those of you people who are just learning about, always, you always know where Acts is now. It's right before Romans. Now finding them, that's on you, but just know those two books are together. Let's go to Acts 10 and let's start at verse um, 34. It says, then Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, underline nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. So that's letting us know that God does not accept you or do great things in your life because you are a certain race, because you have a certain degree, because you look a certain way, because you're light skin, you're dark skin, because you live in the north, because you live in the south, because Acts 10 34 says God shows no partiality and that every nation that does righteous is accepted by him. So that in itself, that one scripture negates everything that the world will try to tell us. Amen? So the challenge challenge or the lie that we have been, especially we as African American people, have been told to believe, have been forced upon us, is to believe the lie and it's been occur occurring since mankind. Even in Jesus' day, the Samaritans were always looked down upon. Uh, you know, you had your, 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 uh, your, in the Jewish community, you had your Pharisees who thought they knew everything, something in my mouth. I got it. That, that hair. That, that thought they knew everything and so therefore they looked down on everybody. So this is not a new occurrence. This is not something that is just set aside for the African American community. Although regardless of where we go in the world and we, I, the pastor has, a job has always enabled us to travel extensively. I have noticed that people of color are always discriminated against. Won't they be surprised if they get there and Jesus looks like us? <laughs> All cute and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, but we have, we, have to, we have had to live down that stigma probably more than any other race in, because we're almost like a, a people without a country. Because if we go to Africa, we're African American, so we, we just kind of don't fit in there either. And then when we get to Africa, a lot of African Americans feel superior to Africans in Africa. I don't get that one yet. And so there's, a, there, w w and then here, you know, Muhammad Ali famously said, why should I go over there and fight for someone that's never called me out of my name uh, for a country that calls me out of my name daily? So it, you can feel lost in this space that we call African Americans, amen? But it doesn't just happen to African Americans, it also happens to white people. I, as I told you, I grew up in the Catholic Church, which is predominantly white and Italian, but they too are discriminated against. Because in this society, economics speaks louder than anything. And if you are considered poor white trash, you too are down at the bottom of the pole. So, to condemn people based on status and skin color is not new in the Bible, nor is it new in society, and it's still a problem that plagues many of us. The problem in the church is we still subscribe to that thinking and not to the thinking that God has ordained us to have from the foundation of the world, amen? So the lie, I think, is it up there? The challenge or the lie that we have, it's been occurring since the beginning of man, but in this current political climate, people are speaking out openly, claiming to be superior to other groups of people. And it's affecting the mindset and the identity of many based on race, gender, and religion. And how many of you know that even Moses had some issues with inadequacy? Go to uh, Exodus. Let's go to the Old Testament. First, we need to always lay a foundation to show that um, we are not dealing with a new devil. Because the Bible says there's no, he has no new tricks. 
He can't, he's not gonna, he can't create anything new to use against you that he hasn't used against someone else at some point. Because if he could do that, Jesus would not have been able to give us the ability to defeat him. Because Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. He came as the perfect example for everything that we would encounter. So he was able to respond to every situation, every challenge, everything that we would encounter, Jesus had to encounter. So if the devil was able to create something new to challenge you with, Jesus would not have been able to provide you with the answer because he's seated at the right hand of the Father. So therefore, God has limited the devil in what he can do. And one thing he can't do is create something new to destroy you. Come on now. Amen. So you have to know what's yeah. already been written yeah. so that you can defeat him because the defense plan, it's like the military. When they go to war, they don't make it up as they go. They've already thought it out. So yeah. you have to get in the word of God and already know what to say when he comes because you already know how he's coming. Amen. Oh. So now Moses in the uh, third chapter, go to the third chapter first. Let's look at verse nine. Now, this is when God is sending Moses to defeat Pharaoh. Moses has, uh, he, he, he try, you know, he, he tried earlier because he recognized slavery is bondage and bondage is always wrong. God gave us dominion over the earth, but not over people. So even your boss at work that lords over you and mistreats you and talks crazy to you, you have to submit to him because we all know you need your check. But at the same time, it doesn't make it right. So instead of snapping him up, you can just pray him out. Amen? Because God, has, God does not give man dominion over man. Amen? He gave us a free will. We have to choose him. He doesn't even force himself on us. Amen? So look at verse number 9. It says, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. So God hears your cries and hears your pleas. Whatever you're going through, he hears it. Amen? Don't think that he's not listening. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. So he sees oppression. It doesn't go unnoticed. He says, come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But here's Moses doubting what God has already put in him. Anytime God gives you an assignment, he has equipped you with the tools to make it come to pass because he says he's the beginning and the end. He's alpha and omega. He saw you complete it before he gave it to you to do. So don't ever, you can feel nervous. And every, you know, that, that's granted. Everybody gets nervous when they have to get up and do something. I didn't want to get up here, I'm, to be honest with you. <laughs> I need pastor to be here because this is, this, I am his, sometimes people will say to me, you know, pastor, so I'm not a pastor. I'm Pastor Terry's wife. Amen. I'm Miss Linda. Amen. I'm not, this is, I taught school, so getting up and teaching is not an issue for me. The context, I don't, I true, this is your life. And I don't want to mess your life up with my craziness. So <laughs> if I don't know what I'm talking about, it makes you so it, there, there should be anybody that gets up before people and talks to them about things they should be doing in life. You should have a, a, a certain semblance of concern. God, and that's why I always say, God, be with me to deliver completely what you want your people to know and not my opinion. Because my opinions won't work for you, and they probably often wouldn't work for me. Amen? So you have to depend on the things of God in this. So God is saying here, so Moses immediately starts to doubt, and he says to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. Now God starts to give him signs to, to let him know that you're not in this by yourself. And he will give you signs to let you know that you're not in this by yourself. Now the sign that you may have may not be as miraculous as what Moses has, because Moses is getting ready to turn a rod, a, a snake into a rod. You may not, some people need that, but he, you, he, you may not get that in this day and age. But you will get signs that you're capable, that you're able. People will start to tell you, you do that well. I don't like doing that, but it comes easy to you. Those are the signs from God letting you know that that thing that you do is different and it's special and we all have them. Amen? Don't ever think that what you do is ordinary. It's, it's not. Amen? 
Okay, let's look at, and then he, he proceeds to go on. Go, skip over to verse 4, chapter 4, verse 10. For time's sake, I don't want to read all those things, but you really should know all those things that are in that passage of Scripture. 10 says, Then Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord. He's still pointing out faults that he has. Now, God has, you have to think about back here, God has allowed him to turn a snake into a rod. He's told him about him being able to turn uh, uh, water into blood. All of this is here, but he still doubts. He says in verse 10, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, ne neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant. But I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Now these things are not in here for us to marvel at Moses. They are in here, they are written for our learning, for us to know that even the great people that God used in the Bible, the people that we quote, the people that we look up to, the people that we aspire to do great and mighty things as they did, they too had shortcomings and they too had doubt. That's what this is about. It's not about oh wow, look at Moses and he's going to later go and part the Red Sea. It's simply for you to see that he took ordinary, simple people, everyday people that had no great abilities. He, this, he, he's got low self-esteem, if you would ask me. Because he says, I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. And so the Lord says to him, who has made man's mouth? Amen. So all those things that he's given you to do, he's already telling you, I put them there. So I will see them to completion. Amen. So we, we as Christians are not as bold in our beliefs. So therefore we, we perpetuate a systemic lie that we're limited in what we can do. And whenever you believe a lie, you can never be all that God has called you to be. Amen. Either way. Whatever the lie. So our objective this morning is, we can put that up there, Andy, is for us to come to terms with the fact that we can't change others. We can't change the world. Stop worrying about how other people see you, what other people think of you. They're never going to do anything for you anyway. Because those people that will do things for you don't need to uh, qualify you usually. Amen? It says, we come to terms with the fact that we can't change others or how they see us. So we must not be affected or bound by what others think of us or say about us. We must know who we are in Christ Jesus. God wants us to know the truth. Go to 1 John. It's all the way in the back of the book. Not John, the Gospel of John, but 1 John. It's in the back of your book. God is always interested in his children knowing the truth. Go to 1 John chapter 2. And verse 16. You know what? Let's start in 3 John first. Let's start 3 John first. Just, just right over. 3 John, let's go to chapter 1. Let's look at verse 2 and 4. It says, everybody there? 1 John chapter 3, verse, cha I'm sorry. 3 John chapter 1. I'm acting like pastor. <laughs> Verse 2. And I get mad when he does that. I'm like, just read it right. <laughs> okay. It says, Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So everyone, am I in the right place? No, I'm not. Dag, Terry, I'm sorry. I did, I, look, I fuss at you all the time and I just did it. Okay, here we are. I'm in the right place now. We're in 3 John chapter 1, verse 2. It says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things, be in health, just as your soul prospers. Your soul, remember, is, you should put that right by your Bible, your mind, your will, your intellect, your imagination. These are the components of your soul. And it says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. So God wants us to know the truth about who we are and what he's called us to do. 
And if you start to believe what the world says about you, you are limited in what you can do through him. Because God will not work with a doubter. He will not work with anyone. That's why he said, you must believe first that I am. If you believe that I am, I can do great and mighty things in you. If you can believe that I exist, if you can believe that I'll speak through you, then he can do great and mighty things through you. Amen? All right. Now, the title of this is Born Identity. Most people base their self-worth on these eight things. Number one, you base your self-worth on your economics. How much money you have. Most of you will pick your friends based on their economic standing. And most of them will do absolutely nothing for you, ever. They will let you watch them be successful in material things and gloat and never in, just allow you to tag along, but never partake or, or pass that on to you. They should, but most don't. You know why? Most people love a caste system. A caste system is where everybody, there's a few people rich and everybody else is poor and they're beneath them and they're watching them. Most people that are wealthy, they enjoy, they embrace that system. And the reason why we know it, they're not, there are so few philanthropic things. The amount of money that's in this country, we should have no one going to bed hungry. Not a single person should go to bed hungry. Thank you, Lauren, for Care Closet. <laughs> Nobody should go to bed hungry because of the amount of money that's in this country. Anytime the lottery can be, what they want to win, 700 and something million dollars? Yeah. Are you serious? <laughs> that's some country's budget for the whole year. And we put, we're playing with it. Amen? So economics. Number two, race. That's very prevalent right now in our society. Once again, we thought when Jim Crow passed away that that would be something, it was something of the past. But how many of you know that we now see that people were harboring those ideas and those resentment in their heart and they were just quiet simply because I believe we had an African American president and they didn't think it was going to be very popular so it was crushed. But now it has reared its ugly head again and boy is it come back with a vengeance. Wow. It's evil. Yes. And it's shocking. Yes. It's really shocking to see that people have still harbored such resentment. Skin color within races. How many of you know that that's still a major, major issue? And it's sad, but it's very, very true. Dark-skinned people disliking light-skinned people. Light-skinned people thinking they're cuter than dark-skinned people. And, and it happens in every race. I have friends that are from India, and one young lady is, uh, they're, they're friends, but one's a lot fairer than the other one. And, and the darker uh, young lady from New Delhi, India, feels like the lighter, fairer-skinned woman will get married sooner and will probably marry wealthier than she will. And no matter how much I try to talk to her about it, that is so ingrained in her brain from her society that it, it just, even though she's, oh, I know you're right, I know you're right, but she keeps saying it. So she really doesn't know that I'm right. Amen? Amen. Number four is your address, where you live. Oftentimes people, uh, they want to know, where do you live? Because they want to know, because it really doesn't matter unless you're picking me up. <laughs> right? But they want to know where you live because they're going to take that information and ascertain your net worth, your value. We go back to economics. Number five, this is one that was hard for me because I grew up with this, north versus south. City versus country. Now I know the Holy Spirit told me to talk about this because I would have never brought this up. I grew up with this. My family still today, when I call, are you still in the South? <laughs> yeah, we're still down here. <laughs> because of the stereotypes with the South. How many of you know those? And a lot of you don't, unless you're from the North, you really don't know what they think about the South. But if you live there, you would, you would probably be like, ooh, ah. And, and, and I find myself now, as I live here, defending the South. Because they feel like everybody here is slow. Everybody. Everybody is slow. <laughs> you know, I said, well, you do know everybody in the South isn't, isn't from the South. You know, not that everybody from the South has to have Northern people tell them what to think, do, and act. But at the same time, it's just a stereotype. 
And, it, it, and it's come uh, from you guys move at a slower pace. I did it this morning when we were coming here to church. I said, T. Jerry, if you don't hurry up and move. It's just, we just rapid fire. You have to be in the north to kind of, I, I don't know where, it, where that came from, but it's just part of it. We move. You all don't. <laughs> I go to the grocery store. I just want to be checked out. Don't ask me what I'm cooking, hon. <laughs> don't say, sweetie and dear, what you cooking tonight? Oh, I see you bought some beans. Are you going to cook great? I'm thinking, oh my God, lady, let's go. <laughs> it's just different. Now that I've been here, I'm, I'm mellowing out. But when I first got here, I wanted to run all y'all over with my car. Will you please move? Will you please yeah, make a complete turn? Stop before you turn. Just turn. So all of those things come. Number six, degrees. How many of you people know people that wear their degrees on their arm like a badge? Their badges. They will tell you about their degrees before they tell you their name. And we want to know what school you went to. I know people that work on Wall Street, I don't know what college they went to. They didn't, they didn't go to Ivy Leagues, but they make the same money that the Ivy League people make. They're rolling, amen? So degrees sometimes. I'm not saying don't get one, because I feel like education is a, a key component in, in, in this society, but don't wear them as a badge. Some people wear their sororities and their fraternities as badges. I'm in an organization where the room is divided by the AKAs and the Deltas and those poor Sigmas are in the back all by themselves. <laughs> and no one's asking them to be on a committee because they feel like they are beneath the other two. Amen? So how many of you know that's not right? That's wrong. People are people. Social clubs, fraternities, sororities, church affiliations. People do it, they, they, they base your self-worth or your net worth on, on your church affiliations. Some churches have a... a, a a stigma of being a church full of wealth, you know, oh, that church is for wealthy people. Oh, they check your W-2 before. No, that church might be doing the word and God is blessing them. Yes. Might be, could be, probably, amen? Amen. Number eight, who they know, name droppers, pictures with stars. Pick some people love, love. I have a friend in New York. She take, I hope she's not listening, but if she is, I've already told her anyway. She loves to take pictures with celebrities. And uh, her husband is in a position of authority where he meets them all the time, so he's always around them, so therefore she has access to them. But it's, she's sending them to you all day long. How many of you know they have the wrong, she has, she has those people in the wrong perspective? Amen? Because they, that doesn't get you anywhere. All right, now let's look at, God has already defined us. He told us that he made us in his image and his likeness. So therefore, if he made us in his image and his likeness, then therefore we do not have to try to change ourselves to fit a mold that someone else has uh, ascribed for us. How many of you know that fat shaming now is a huge problem in our society? Amen? Everybody is not going to be a size zero, but everybody should be healthy. That's the key component. If you go to the doctor and he doesn't tell you you need to lose weight, you're probably good. But if you go and he tells you you need to lose weight because your heart, your kidney, your livers, then we probably need to get you to talk to Selena. You need help with that. And Amen? I, I, right now I'm bigger than I've ever been in my life and I keep saying I need to call Selena. But <laughs> I gotta get, I'm fighting the sugar addiction. Amen? But, you ha but just recognize that God has made you in his image and his likeness and you are wonderfully made. Amen? Amen. And so if you don't believe that, you'll allow someone to talk you out of that. All right, let's look at the first one, and we want to always look at these in detail. But I wanted to go through all eight quickly just in case my time was out and we didn't get to. Let's go to my net worth doesn't define me. Go to 1 Timothy chapter number 6. 1 Timothy. All the T books are together. And let's look at chapter 6, verse 17. It says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they, that they be rich in good works, 
ready to give, willing to share. Now, I said in the intro to this, most people that are extremely wealthy, you do, you do have some exceptions. Oprah gives, Bill Gates gives, Warren Buffett gives. But how many of you know that there are far more billionaires and millionaires in this country? There's more in this country than any other country. And there's far more than those three or four that we can name. Amen. Now, some people do view things anonymously, cause, and the reason why they do it is because they don't want all of us begging. And that's okay. I understand. I get with that. But there are far more in this country than you would ever know. But God is, is, is very strategic in his he's saying here. First of all, he tells us, don't be haughty. So if you make 20,000 and somebody else makes 10, because everything's relevant, the person that makes 20 will try to act haughty, prideful, arrogant. God is saying here, don't do that because riches are uncertain. And what does he mean by that? You could lose your job. Then what? Ten looks good, right? <laughs> Ten looks real good when you were making 20 and you lost it. You lost your job and now you're not making anything. The person with 10 is now doing better than you. And then he tells us that we should, those that are rich, we should do good works. We should be ready to give. Be ready to give. I've seen so many people, when Pastor was working in the NBA uh, especially, and we, would, we were around a lot of these kind of people, filthy rich, very, got their money very young, as a, just as a sidebar to make you maybe understand why they didn't. But I always felt like if you came from nothing and then you get something, look like you ought to be more eager to give back. Yeah. Amen? But they're not, believe it or not. It's a hoarder's mentality where if I give and then I might end up back over there where I was, so I, therefore I'm just going to hold it and spend it all on me. Amen? So that if I go broke, I went broke spending it on me. I didn't go broke giving it away to other people. And that's sort of the mentality that runs through that, that group. But God is always telling us, be ready to give. And often we, the, the league forces them to do a certain amount of philanthropic work and they and, and a lot of times they felt like their presence was the philanthropic work. You know, I'll just go to a school and give a speech and inspire kids. And I used to say when I due to the platform that we had at the time, I would always say, you know, it would probably be better if you bought a room full of computers and not go. Mm. Mm. It would. Because the computer software and the, the, the ability to learn how to work that mechanism will far outlast you coming in and saying, stick to your dreams, don't get in trouble to a kid that's going home who maybe has nothing to eat. Or to a house that has no one, a father is not there to keep them from drugs and gangs. So I would often say, if you're going in lieu of giving, don't go, but give. Yeah. Penny was very good, that was uh, pastor's principal at the time, very good about giving back to schools and things of that nature. But sometimes we need to recognize that giving is, I used to tell people sometimes when they would say, well, I want to go by and see, check on so-and-so, they lost a spouse, and you know, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to go and, and do, I'm just going to go by and see them. I said, why don't you just get a gift card or go to the grocery store and take food, and because the sole breadwinner is gone now. So always be thinking in the mindset of giving and not just showing up empty-handed. Now, if you don't have anything, show up empty-handed and clean up. That's what I did. That's what I used to do when Pastor and I, uh, uh, everybody knows when Pastor I always called his hiatus with the federal government for three years and nine months. And sometimes I, w I was struggling to do, I had to, everything was on me. And so I, and things would happen in people's homes and I wanted, I always had a spirit to give and want to help, but I didn't have the extra cash because I needed to pay so I would have lights. So I would go and say, okay, I'm going to wash the dishes. Where's your vacuum cleaner? Let me, I'll, I'll do your wash. I'll take your clothes back over to my house and I'll wash them, I'll bring them back. So there's always a way to give and to help, amen? But so that's why don't let your net worth define you. I will still do that today as I did it back then, amen? That is the heart of God. That's the compassion that he wants us to have. Yeah. Regardless of what you have, you are able to give back. Everybody is able to give, amen? Give of your time. 
Amen? All right, num the next one, examples of racism and skin color. We're going to go back to this because I had so many people call me about this. Go to the Song of Solomon. You might have to look, go to the table of content first. And this is something that, wow, the time goes so fast. This is something that a lot of people, a lot of people, especially people of color, go through this. And it's time to shame the devil, amen, and to give you confidence in who you are and how God made you, amen. And I, I have, look, I'm going to say something on behalf of the light-skinned sisters today. We do not automatically think we're cute, people. <laughs> a lot, a lot of, of, of fair-skinned women are mistreated. I was growing up in school. I could not figure it out. Like, why doesn't she like me? I've done nothing to her. I don't, even, she doesn't, I don't even know her. She doesn't know me. I'd like to know. I was probably so friendless based on that alone, and it was unfair to me. Because if you had gotten to know me, you would see that I was nothing like what you perceived me to be. Amen? And as I told you before, uh, if you know our history of people of color, my color came from somebody way back sometime getting raped, probably. Amen? So you need to look at the full spectrum. I, black men, don't feel like you have a, gotten a prize because you're, you're the woman that you're attracted to may be fair-skinned. Amen? The prize is in, God didn't specify a color, a shape. He just said a man that finds a wife finds a good thing, regardless. Amen? Amen. So some things we have to stop believing, accepting, receiving, and believing ourselves first before we can move forward and be all things that God has called us to be. Now, in the Song of Solomon, God puts everything in his word so that we would know. This is, most people never go to this book, but this is an excellent book when dealing with this subject. Simply because you have a Shulamite. This is a love story between Solomon and one of his wives, the Shulamite. And she is extremely dark, and she keeps putting herself down, and Solomon keeps trying to build her up. In verse 5, that's where it starts. You, the whole book is amazing, but verse 5, I'm only going to point out the key components. It says, the Shulamite is the woman, and I, I'm giving you this background simply so that you, you will understand it. She says, rightly, do they, do they love you? She's saying, rightly, it's right that they love you. But I am dark, but I'm lovely. She knew that. <laughs> o daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon, do not look upon me because I am dark. That's low self-esteem. Because the sun has tanned me, my mother's sons were angry with me. How many of you know, especially, I've, and I, I've heard it here in the South more than anywhere, people were told, don't go outside and get dark. Don't stay outside long. I've had some older women that live down here. That was a taboo to, and I see, I told you about a lady in my neighborhood that I was walking with. She's Japanese, and it's 900 degrees in the shade in Georgia, and she's completely covered. Long sleeves, a hat, gloves, gloves, glasses. And she looked so crazy, I, who never speak to people, had to ask her, because she was walking with me. I said, why do you have all this stuff on in this heat? I, could, I just couldn't take it anymore. And I'd been, do, I'd been seeing her for months. I talked to nobody. I'm just walking. I'm, I usually have my earphones on, listen to the word, but I had to, <laughs> to pull one out. <laughs> Basically, what is wrong with you? <laughs> and she said, me not want my skin to get dark. I said, what? Now, she, she, that might be why she's this big, because she's, I, and I'm th I said, you're not afraid you're going to pass out? Because she's stopping every five minutes to wipe her brow. But she's, I, she still do it. I see her all the time. It didn't stop her. There's a stigma in every, I'm showing you, in every race, there is that stigma. And here you see it in the Bible. It says, my mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. 
Because she was dark, she's thrown outside, and that's where you get your house slave from your field slave mentality. Amen? Amen. Now, look, skip over to verse 15. Now, this, the beloved is Solomon talking back to her, and he says, Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have dove's eyes. And she doesn't want to hear because she immediately goes into 16 and she says, Behold, you are, you are handsome, my beloved. You, yes, pleasant. So she immediately starts to combat his love and her beauty by saying, No, 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 no. You are pretty. She doesn't want to hear it. She doesn't want to believe it. She doesn't even want him to say it. How many of you know that's low self-esteem? Go to chapter 6. I'm sorry, 5. Go to 5. 510. It's right above it. Start at 5, 510. Now she starts to tell him about his appearance. She says, My beloved is white and ruddy, chief among 10,000. His head is like the finest gold. His locks are wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by the rivers of water, washed with milk. She immediately starts to tell him how wonderful and how amazing he is and not allowing him to tell her how wonderful and amazing she is. So how many of you know that that is a deep-seated issue that you're going to need prayer about and you need to believe that the way God made you is the way he intended for you to be and you are wonderfully and marvelously made and that you are beautiful? Amen. And if somebody in your family tells you that you're not because they're messed up in the head, you need to start schooling them on who you are and, and, and what you can accomplish. You can never, ever accomplish all that God has called you to be if you believe that the, your skin color is going to limit you in any way. It's low self-esteem is what, is what is limiting you. It's not your skin color. You are beautiful and you are wonderful and you can do great and mighty things regardless who's in office, regardless of what they call you, regardless of what they think about you. Just don't act the way they expect you to act because of those things. Amen? Amen. Amen. Don't ever forget that. And if you need somebody to tell you and to remind you, call me. <laughs> Amen? Because we have to stop allowing that self-defeatist attitude because it's destroying our communities, it's destroying our children, and it's limiting their possibilities because we're creating a generation that, that's looking to that too much. Amen? How many, I remember one time, uh, it, it, I don't know, it was years ago, where people used to say, uh, you know, black men are in style. They, you, we've always been in style. Amen? Amen. Our culture has always been in style. Most people don't have one, so they copy ours and they take it and they make money off of it and we're ashamed of it. Now you have women of d different ethnicities wearing cornrows and now all of a sudden it's beautiful when we've been doing it forever. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Own us. Amen. Own our culture. Own it. Walk proudly in it. You see other... I I cannot convince those Asian people in my neighborhood to stop covering up and whether they're going to fall out and faint. They, that's who they are. I can't stop them from eating their meals, that their, their certain food types. But we try to assimilate too much and forget who we are. Amen. God made us at who we are and gave us the culture that we have. So therefore, let's embrace it. Embrace who you are. Amen. Our Christian response to racism should be, first, we should examine our own hearts. Make sure you don't have any racial issues in your heart. Because we as African American people, plus Bruce, <laughs> we can have some issues in our heart. We can say all white people do this all the time. All Asian people do this all the time. Amen? So, but what may be the factor is if we act a certain way all the time, they react the same way all the time. So watch how you're acting to, for, and then see how they're acting. Now, I'm not asking you to be a doormat because I'm certainly not a doormat. Amen? Amen. Second, we should fight racism in all true forms of racism that still exist in society. How do we do that? I don't allow people to tell me jokes about white people. That's not funny to me. Amen. Amen. I don't allow people to tell me jokes about Jamaican, people from Jamaica. They got 29 jobs. You need to get one. <laughs> Amen. 
<laughs> so you have to you have to combat it where where it is. You cannot pick your friends based on a fear of you know I'm I, you know they're different. I have fit friends of every ethnicity. I true we have so and New York is a melting pot. It's full of them. So we, we the church in New York was full of people of all ethnicities. I went out of my way to make them feel comfortable. Amen. So you have to fight race. You don't allow. You don't laugh at jokes about people of a different race or a different color. If you if you're fair skinned you don't laugh at jokes about people that are dark. You just sit there and look at them like that was stupid. Amen. So they don't tell you that joke anymore. Amen. Some things we allow because we participate in it unwillingly. Third, we should be compassionate toward true victims of racism. Some people truly are. Now, some people scream it all the time. You know, I, we, Pastor and I were counseling this guy, and he said they fired him because he was black. And then Terry started to ask him questions, come and find out. He was missing work about two or three times. He said, I'd have fired you. <laughs> so, and he should have been. So we, we have to, true forms of racism that we, we should, it's a sin. And until sin, the sin problem is dealt with, we will have those issues, but we have to know how to deal with them within ourselves. Amen? Amen. And sometimes church can be very silent about this issue. Very, very silent about it. Uh, I have, we have visited churches before where you knew you weren't welcome and you could feel it. And me being me, I'm not one, most people would just leave, Terry always said, baby, leave them people alone. TJ will tell you, I'll write them, I'll call them. Because <laughs> I want you to know, I'm not rude, I'm not mean, but I will. I, will. I wrote a letter and I called. I, I wrote the letter, I didn't get a response from the letter, which I thought that I should have, so I called. I said, I, I told them who I was, who I needed to speak to. I need to speak to your senior pastor. I don't have time for anybody else. Because it's not going to make it up the chain. I already know because I wrote you a letter and I didn't get a call. So. Well, you know, of course they tell you, you know, well that person can't, when can he call me? Bet. Or I can come there. Now they don't want you to come there. So he'll call you. And I told him, I need you to know that although you may love the Lord, I need you to know that we did not feel welcome in your, in your service. So I need you, if you love the Lord, to deal with that. Because the Lord Jesus Christ would never have wanted me to feel unwelcome in there. So you need to invite him back in. <laughs> right? Amen. So there, there are so because we a lot of times we just like to just flick stuff off and say, oh, if we don't, if Martin Luther King had never said all of us would still be on the back of a bus, train, plane, whatever you were riding, probably wouldn't even be able to get on the plane. So you, you have to understand this. Let's deal with North versus South. This is truly God because I would have never brought this up. Let's go to John 1, the book of John. John chapter, this is the gospel according to John. And let's go to chapter 1, and we're going to go to verse, I think it's 46. So, now, if you live in the south, you stop talking about people in the north, because you all do it too. You think every, all of us are rude. We're not rude. We busy. We going. <laughs> we got stuff to do. <laughs> we don't have time for pleasantries. But what uh, Monica and Bobby, uh, what, Monica, when did you guys go to New York? In July? Yes. It was July, wasn't it? Monica was so shocked, I could tell. She fell in love with the people. They were so sweet to them. And it was surprising to us, me and Bruce laughed. It was surprising to us because we recognized how people really believe that stereotype. They really believe everybody, you know, <coughs> Faylene's from New York as well. Everybody, they felt like everybody they met was going to be rude and abrasive and abrupt. And, it, and, it, and, it, and it's really not like that. Now, they are in a hurry. <laughs> they may say hi and keep it moving. But, but it's just the pace. Every place has a pace. Amen. Every job has a pace. Everywhere has a pace. And you all have a slower, just have a slower pace. Amen. I've had, and I've had to defend you to people in uh, New York because they was, you still down there? What, you know? So it's, it's kind of like, uh, they feel like it's just so laid back. Now you all are <laughs> very laid back. But it's just a different pace. Amen. It's not wrong. 
They're not wrong in the north. We're not, I'm, I'm originally from Illinois. Chicago has the same kind of pace that New York has, so I was able to jump right in there, and that was great. But this is different. This is very, very different for me. So, but it's neither is wrong. It's just the pace. Amen. Amen. Neither is wrong. Now, go to the book of John. I want to show you how people have stereotypes. Remember I told you, everything we deal with, God deal with. Uh, go to, look at verse 46. It says, And Nathanael said, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. So Nathaniel already had, um, we, uh, my family and I, we went to Israel, and uh, so this resonates with me. If you, if you ever get the chance to go to Israel, go, because the Bible jumps off the pages at you, because it makes you more aware. Everything comes alive. Because, now, because I've been there, I know that Nazareth is a little bitty dot within Galilee. Galilee is the be-all and end-all. And it would be someone um, like, uh, let's say, you know, everybody calls this Atlanta proper. So if you're from Atlanta and you meet somebody and they say, I don't even know, what's another need be town in Georgia? You know, I'll make up one. Well, I know. Uh, you know, well, I'm from, I tell you, let's switch it. it. Let's say you're in Birmingham, Alabama. And somebody says, I'm from Muscle Shoals, Alabama. The people in Birmingham are going to laugh. What? You know what I mean? Like, you need to come to the city. And so that's the way Nazareth is to Galilee. Galilee is the city, and Nazareth is just a little backwoods, backdrop, little bitty. Bit. So that's why Nathaniel says to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Like, it's, it's the pits. It's the bottom of the barrel. And he's saying, Philip has said to him, come and see. So you see, everybody at some, you, we all go, you all go through that. So you should never be ashamed of where you're from. You might, some people are. They will, you know, they might be from Donkey Kong, Georgia, and they're going to say, I'm from Atlanta, and Donkey Kong is three hours from Atlanta. But because they're ashamed of where they're from, they make, you know, they, they just pull it all in. The whole state of Georgia is Atlanta. <laughs> Everybody is from Atlanta. <laughs> Amen. So you, but the Bible is dealing with this because he's saying, come and see. Jesus was from a little backwoods dot on the map. Amen. In Israel. So you, you know, he's saying he was prejudiced against it. Look at uh, John. Go to John 7, verse 51. I'm trying to show you that you have to be proud of who you are regardless of how you look, where you live, how much money you have, uh, what you do. Amen. You are God's gift to the world that he made marvelously and wonderfully crafted you. Amen. So look at 751. It says, does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? And they answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. Now he's telling them, don't talk about, don't, don't, don't judge people based on uh, hearing him or what he's doing. But they're basically saying, I don't even care about that because aren't you from Galilee? You know, like, you ain't nothing, you're from Galilee. I'm going to tell you a good example for America. If you go to London, people in Great Britain feel like, oh, darling, you're from across the pond. <laughs> you, you broke away from the best, <laughs> and now you come back to visit. <laughs> they feel like they're better. They're elitist. People, Paris, the same way. People, French people think American people are the stupidest people on the planet. They think we are so, so, so there, there's, so don't, think that when you live here in America, you think America is the it and everybody else is stupid and dumb and every, just like people in America think everybody in Africa lives in the bush. Africa has major cities, people, an airport and filthy rich people. Everybody doesn't live in the bush and everybody isn't broke in Africa. Amen? 
So you, those stereotypes, we have also. And, he's, and here is a perfect example. He doesn't even want to know what he's doing, what he's saying, what he's done, the great things he can bring to them. He's just saying, wait a minute now, aren't you from Galilee? Who great has risen out of Galilee? Amen. So you have to recognize that those stereotypes that you hold, they're limiting you and they're never ever going to allow you to do the great and mighty things that God has in store for you. My address doesn't define me. The, the, are the scriptures up there for that? The address. The one thing God wants you to do with your house is be hospitable. He said, I give you these homes for you to be. My presence should dwell in them. That's number one. When you get into your home, if you've never done it, when you go back in it today, that's the first thing you need to do. You invite God's presence in your home. Your home should be peaceful. When people come in, they should feel the peace of God in there. In here, I get clarity, because wherever the peace of God is, there's clarity. There's clarity of vision. When I come here, I'm, 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 I can be a clear thinker. I feel the love of God. Don't have a house where people come in and they feel like, okay, baby, don't sit there. Don't stand there. Is this okay? Can, can we get some water? I'll take the melted cup, the, the plastic cup and melt it a little bit. Don't have a home like that. That's not a home. That's a museum. When we go to museums, we abide by those rules. And the reason why you do it in a museum is they are trying to preserve the artifacts that they have for generations. But in your home, you should not be trying to preserve that couch until Jesus comes back. Amen. Amen. Sit on the couch. Take the plastic off and sit down. Don't buy it. <laughs> Do not buy something you can't enjoy because it's, it's an idol. You now want people to just to come in and look at it. Oh, that's so nice. If you seen their house. No, I ain't seen their house because I'm not going in a museum and, and do that. I'm, I want to go places where we, you can relax, where you can chill. Amen? So make sure you don't have a house that you, has become an idol to you. Don't make, make sure you don't have a house you can't walk away from. I've walked away from some amazing pieces of property that God has blessed us with. But I always believe uh, he, he's, he's going to give me another one. The next one's going to be better. And if, I gotta, if it looks like I'm going backwards, you really don't know God because he's not. He's setting me up for something greater. Amen? Amen. Amen. So you have to stop looking at I know people, their way that, they're that way with their car because their car defines them. They may be pulling it up to an apartment, but they got a bad car. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. So their car defines them. Don't have anything that you can't enjoy. God wants us to be hospitable. Now, you don't let people tear things up. I don't let kids come over and tear my house up because they can't replace it. But you, you, you need to be able to enjoy your things. So being hospitable is the most important thing for God. First Peter 4 and 9, we don't have time to go there. Write it down. God is telling us, Romans 12, 13, Hebrews 13, 2. He's asking us, be hospitable. Be hospitable. Invite the saints in. Invite people in. Give them the peace of God. Encourage them. Feed them. Amen? Amen. And, and you'd be surprised. Some people don't, you don't have to have a fancy meal. You don't have to have lamb and steak. All we have is chicken. All we have is bologna. All we have is turkey. You're welcome. That's hospitable. That's hospitality. Your degrees and your school affiliations. Proverbs 1 and 7 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It's not your degree. Have God first, then the degree. Teach people that you encounter about God first, and then you can tell them where you went to school. Let them see the light of Christ in your life first, and then you are... They, they, don't, don't use them as a badge of, of uh, entrance into someone's life. Amen? I know people that immediately, as soon as you start talking, all they're talking about, oh, I went to Morehouse, and, you know, and you're like, and you're still stupid. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Because some people, they, they, they demean people with all of their, their degrees and the, all these alphabets after their name. I know people that, you know, if you don't address them by it, you know, they're offended. Yeah. Well, dang, you was that longer than you was this. So what's, you know, like, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So you have to understand, you know, I'm Dr. So-and-so now. You know, oh, that's good. Jesus is still Lord. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, 
And I went to college. And Terry teases all the time. He always said, baby, you got more degrees than third. But you don't know that unless you ask me that because I don't wear them. They were a means to an end. They did not define me. I needed to make more money if we really want to be real about it. I was teaching school with a bachelor's and I said, this is not going to get it. <laughs> so I had to go back. You do, you do it, it's a means to an end, but, it, but I'm the same person before the cap and gown that I was after it. And that's what you have to be. Do not allow those things to define you. And then 1 John 2 and 27 says, God will teach us all things if we stay in him. If you're not able to go to college, make every attempt to go because I struggle strongly suggest you go and we should send our kids and we should encourage our children to go because we live in a society that does honor them and does respect them and does pay according to them. Amen. So I encourage everyone to go. But when you're going, don't ever forget that Jesus is still Lord, that you are created in the perfect image of God and that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So if you dropped out, don't feel bad. Figure out a way to make it anyway. Amen. 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 So don't ever allow those limitations to be placed on you because those are man-made limitations. But we should always aspire to be our best and do our best. Don't allow it to become a crutch for you. Don't say to someone that did graduate, well, if I had graduated, because now that's a pity party and God doesn't come to those. Amen. 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 Finally, and I'm going to run through this anyway. I'm going to borrow time too because a uh, pastor is, I'm not, he going to be here. <laughs> networking. Net, this is the networking town I've ever seen in my whole entire life. You don't have to know people to get anywhere. You know Jesus. You know the right person. This town has more pyramid schemes than any place I think I've ever been in my life. It's amazing to me. You do, and, 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 and reality stars, and I'm thinking, about what in the world? You do not have to be a brown noser to make it to the top people. Amen? You don't have to know the popular person in school. Be the popular person in school Amen. for acting right, living right, getting good grades, doing the right thing, being respected by your peers. The, the, don't ever, ever think that God has placed in someone else the key ingredient that you need to be somebody. He won't do that. He would never do that because he knows they may trip out on you and throw you all off. Come on now. Amen. So he can never allow that. So networking, you, you're nice. You're, you know, you're, you can be complimentary when you mean it, but don't be complimentary to gain position because you can't keep it because you will constantly have to inflate that ego to stay in that spot and it will wear on you. Amen. So you have to understand not first Thessalonians two and four says, don't be a pleaser of men. Please God first. Men are fickle. Yes. They will not stay by you long. Amen. Men and women. Amen. Amen. So you have to, don't ever esteem, Luke 16, 15 says, don't esteem men higher than God. Your God is always first. And whoever you need to meet, he's going to make sure that they cross your path and that they will like you first. Amen. 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 They're going to like you first. They're going to reach out to you. You're not going to have to do all that shucking and jiving and lying. Amen. <laughs> You're not going to have to do it because it's a lie. Don't ever do that. And women of God, don't, you need to remember that. You don't ever chase a man. The Bible says a man finds a good thing. You don't think of yourself more highly than that. You're the prize. A lot of women feel like they're, you know, he's the prize. He's not the prize. You complete him. He was here first and God still had to bring you on the scene to make him help me. Amen. So you have to understand that who you are. And if you don't know who you are, people will take advantage of you and they will use you and discard you. So you have to know it. The effects of a lost identity. We see this in people every day and we don't know what's wrong with them. We just label them all crazy. Number one, they're usually depressed. A person that's living a life of this, trying to figure out who to like, who to talk to, how to get a degree so they can use it, how to, uh, how to uh, call somebody's name, be a name dropper, how to do the uh, low self-esteem, trying to get past being dark or trying to get past having a wide nose or, or, or big eyes or all these people, they're going to have these symptoms. You don't know why, you just call them crazy. They're going to, depression sets in. Discouragement. 
They are so discouraged because they keep looking at a magazine and the TV scene to figure out where they need to be, what they need to look like, how they need to do it. And so therefore, discouragement sets in because how do you know you can't, some things you just can't change. Amen. Fear and anxiety. You're so afraid you're going to make a mistake that you start and that you're going to look foolish or you're going to be inadequate that you cannot fulfill God's purpose for your life. Fear and anxiety fills you. You're so afraid to make a mistake that you'll just stay at that job that you know is going nowhere and you have greater things and greater ideas in you and you just sit right there because you are so afraid of making a mistake but you know within your know I can do more. Mm -hmm. Hypersensitivity. You so, and let me tell you what that means. Let me tell you who that is. You say, hey, how you doing? What? <laughs> I like that dress. I had it on last week. <laughs> Hypersensitive. You're just so sensitive. Everything everybody says, you're just jumping down their throat. That's, there's not a problem with the person. The problem's with you. Mixed emotions. You're just all over the place. The last person you talk to is the opinion you hold. You don't know nothing. You, you just, you just up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. That's a song, isn't it? Who sang that? That's a, it's in a song. Up, down, up, down, up, down, anyway. You're just everywhere. And nobody usually likes to be around people like this. I know I don't. I run from everybody with these issues. Mixed emotions are bad because you, God is steady. He says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So anybody that's all across the rector scale, you're going to be a problem. You're going to have a problem finding friends. Nobody wants to be bothered with you. And it's not them, it's you. You shut down emotionally. Many people just detach the world. They don't have anything to do with anybody. I've done this before. I just kind of, when we first moved here, it was kind of like, Lord, I just detached. I just shut down. Just stayed in the house, just like, oh, whatever. Can't believe I'm here. How we get here? <laughs> when we leave it. <laughs> so you just shut down. It's just like, I can't cope with this, so I just shut down. That's not good. That's losing of identity. And I saw it changing my personality. So I had to fight back. Like, okay, no, I can't do this. I can't. This is not who I am. So you have to watch that. Some things you have to watch. Self-esteem attacks. They're similar to panic attacks. You just so ner you can't you can't you can't move. You can't function. Things you know you can do. You start to doubt that you can do them and all this. That's because you suddenly start to feel like maybe I'm not as great as I thought I was. Maybe I don't sing as well as I thought I did. Maybe I don't speak as well as I thought I did. Maybe I don't read. Maybe I'm not that great. Maybe I'm not that good. So you just start to, they're self, they're, you just have self-esteem attack. You start beating, attacking yourself because you start to allow all these voices to get in and tell you opposite of who you really are. And then finally, next you have an appearance of shyness. Some people just start to say, well, I'm just shy. I'm an introvert. When really it's, I don't feel comfortable in my skin. I don't feel comfortable with who I am. I don't know what to do. So I'm just going to get over here and find me a spot and get quiet. But God gave, put something in you, and it can't ever come out if you're too afraid to bring it out, to release it. And it, it's a way that people will dominate you. They'll look over you. They'll avoid you. They, won't, they'll just, they, they will automatically write your name down. Okay, Mildred coming. Because they know, they just tell you, come on, you go, go. Because <laughs> you're too shy to speak up and too, you don't have the bold, you've lost the boldness to say, I'm not doing that. I was a little nice to tell people stuff like that. They'd say, come on, we're going to the store. I ain't going with you. <laughs> don't take that from your kids. Amen. Because you want to develop leaders. Give them the ability and the voice to say, I'm not doing that. And that's okay to do that. Amen. Especially with other kids. Lastly, you will encounter people that they're angry, they're mean, they're jealous, they're envy, they have resentment, and you don't know why. The reason why is because they feel like I can't ever be great in who I am. So they're just mad, and they feel like they don't have lost control, they don't have any control over it, they, don't have any, they can't do anything about it, and so they get angry. And there's jealousy will set in, because then they start to look at people that have what they think they should have, and, they, and it makes them angry, and so then therefore, now we deal with all the anger and the resentment. Some people, you meet them at 6 o'clock in the morning, they're already mad. <laughs> you just woke up. <laughs> <laughs> you just got, who made you mad at 6.30? Yeah. So you, you have to, but these are things that are in our heads. 
And they've been in, they're in our heads because we don't know who we are. Who is your born identity? I close with this story. You guys know I love that movie with Jason Bourne called Born Identity. And do you know the, the theme of that movie? There's four of them now. This made billions of dollars. They're trying to kill him before he can recognize who he is. He has amnesia. And all throughout the movie, he's trying to figure out, but he knows he can do great things and he can't figure out where it came from. He was like, why do I know this and why can I outrun everybody? And he can beat the stew out of anybody. And he, he's just so calculating. It's almost like he has another person talking to him. For us, it's the Holy Spirit. He can do anything. He can't figure out. But, and then he's trying to figure out, why are they trying to kill me? And they go to great lengths to kill this man, TJ, and I love this movie, because they don't want him to know. They're trying to kill him before he knows he's amazing. And that's what the devil is trying to do with you. He's trying to kill you before you know you're amazing. And if he can stop you there, then therefore you never reach your full potential. And everybody connected to you is limited in what they can do because you haven't reached your full potential. So you have to recognize I'm amazing and I deserve the best. Amen? Amen. Give God a hand praise for his word today.